my task in the next few minutes is to try to review uh, all of all of the things you need to know about diabetes and peripheral arterial disease. Uh, so we'll speak briefly about the epidemiology. I think Nisha's lecture uh, really uh, covers most of the high points about the risk factors for atherosclerotic vascular disease. When I was in medical school, one of my professors called diabetes atherosclerosis mellitus. Uh, as, as one of the uh, nicknames for the disease because it really uh, keeps uh, company with atherosclerosis. We'll talk about diagnostic evaluation, medical therapy, and some of the definitive treatment options as they're relevant to, to this patient population. So uh, a couple of key references for those interested. There's a new guideline statement from uh, about 18 months ago uh, that covers all of this information in great detail from the societies that many of us are members of. Uh, and a couple of nice review articles that are uh, accessible on the web and some appropriate use documents. Uh, but let's start with a case to kind of put this in clinical context uh, for everybody. This is a patient I treated last week. Um, she's a 72-year-old woman, type 2 diabetes, who presented to her primary care physician for evaluation of left leg pain while working. She still works full-time as a housekeeper. She's an industrious New Yorker. Um, she can walk about two blocks before stopping because of left camp calf cramping. Uh, and despite this, she's continued to walk, but she finds that it now slows her down, uh, and she's having a hard time uh, performing her work in the same uh, rapid way that she's used to. Her past medical history is notable for diabetes for about 10 years, hypertension, and high cholesterol. She's never smoked uh, and has a family history notable for a, a father and a mother, both of whom died of heart attacks uh, in their 60s. She's on aspirin, lisinopril, atorvastatin, and metformin, so it should sound familiar from what you just heard. Uh, and on physical examination, uh, her, her primary doctor noticed that she had weak pulses in the left foot, uh, which had not previously been noted. And I, frankly, was impressed that her primary doctor even took off her shoes and socks to examine her feet. So just keep this patient uh, as a thumbnail in the back of your head as we talk about peripheral arterial disease. You've heard about atherosclerosis in detail from, from Nisha, but I, I think it's important to understand that peripheral artery disease is very common. And as patients age uh, and as they develop risk factors, such as uh, specifically diabetes, the incidence of peripheral artery disease increases. So if you look at this uh, figure from top to bottom, as patients get older, uh, the incidence of peripheral artery disease increases such that most patients that we see in our practices, Medicare age patients, who are either age 70 or between 50 and 69 with diabetes or tobacco use history, um, about a third of those patients are going to have peripheral arterial disease. Now, unfortunately, only half of those patients will have overt symptoms and will know it. So this is a silent disease in many, many patients. And if you look at the overlap, um, those patients who have peripheral artery disease, about half of them will have significant coronary disease and vice versa. So these patients have a systemic disease. Uh, which we've already talked about, which is atherosclerosis. This is also about a quarter of these patients will have cerebrovascular disease or carotid stenosis and intracerebral disease, which can lead to stroke. So stroke, heart attack, and peripheral arterial disease uh, run together. Uh, and many of these patients uh, will have multiple manifestations of atherosclerosis. And if you ask patients, you know, what are you more afraid of? Are you afraid of uh, dying from Hodgkin's disease or breast cancer? or from the diagnosis of PAD, they'll always say that cancer is more frightening. But if you look at the mortality risk at five years, patients who are diagnosed with PAD have a higher mortality rate than those who are diagnosed with early uh, stage breast cancer or Hodgkin's disease. And that's because of the systemic risk of cholesterol plaque called atherosclerosis, which is what's the underlying pathophysiology of heart attack and stroke. Now, if you look at men and women, and specifically focusing here on women, just like uh, the incidence of heart disease, peripheral artery disease increases with age, and there are ethnic predilections uh, that distinguish different groups uh, and can, uh, specifically here in New York in our population, uh, results in an epidemic proportion, near 40% uh, incidence of PAD in women over the age of 80 amongst African Americans uh, and uh, and other, other groups, including uh, Asian uh, American Indians, for example. The risk factors we've talked about, diabetes, if you think about the magnitude of risk, smoking and diabetes confer the, the gr greatest amount of risk to the patients uh, who develop uh, uh, PAD ultimately. And so again, diabetes is one of the principal risk factors. And, and as Nisha talked about, um, diabetic patients are predominantly uh, afflicted by atherosclerotic vascular disease 
and over 75% of all hospitalizations of diabetic uh, patients with complications are re resulting from atherosclerosis. And the patients with type 1 atherosclerosis um, have more diffuse disease, as you heard about, and have a dramatically higher risk of concordant nephropathy uh, or kidney dysfunction. Off the screen on the bottom is uh, that the fact that two to five per, uh, fold excess risk of peripheral artery disease is seen in diabetics, uh, and women are even higher risk for developing PAD. So you, this is another one of those charts from medical school that makes you nauseated, but um, I, I'd like to, to highlight the fact that, as, as Nisha pointed out, inflammation is thought to be a, a key driver of the development of progressive atherosclerosis. And so patients who have uh, diabetes typically have a higher inflammatory environment in which they develop higher burdens of atherosclerotic vascular disease with more diffuse disease, have more uh, plaque ulceration, which causes clotting or thrombosis, uh, which ultimately leads to heart attacks and other kinds of limb problems, and a calcification, which becomes a difficult problem for us when we're trying to open or unclog these arteries. So patients at increased risk for PAD, again, I, I wanted to highlight that anybody over 50 uh, or even younger than 50 with diabetes and any other risk factor is considered high risk. So we've realized over the last three decades that patients with diabetes are at amongst the highest risk for PAD, and these patients need to be screened aggressively. Um, the clinical manifestations range from asymptomatic in 50% of patients to the type of symptoms that my patient was describing, intermittent claudication, which is uh, the, the clinical description we give to calf cramping with, with walking. And then older patients can develop functional impairment with difficulty walking, and they can develop ulcers or even gangrene, uh, which is not uncommon in diabetic patients who have severe neuropathy and can't feel their feet and then develop ulcers that get infected. Uh, and can't heal properly because of lack of circulation. We have a couple of different grading scales, and I think the most important one is uh, this one called the Rutherford scale, where we can measure uh, how bad people's intermittent claudication or PAD is based on how far they walk. And I used to practice in Cleveland where walking a block didn't matter as much as it does here in New York City. But uh, if a patient can uh, walk with limited symptoms and go as far as they want, they have a Rutherford 1. If they can walk more than two blocks, that's a Rutherford two. Less than two blocks, that's a Rutherford three. And this is sort of mild, moderate, and severe symptomatology. Once you get past that and have pain at rest, you have a different kind of a problem, which we call critical limb ischemia, which I won't talk too much about. The examination, if patients have uh, suspected PAD, should include a full pulse exam, uh, as well as measurement of both arm blood pressures and, lo and looking for f findings that are consistent with poor circulation. Um, I'm gonna, I know that, that we were at the dinner hour, but I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of what we might see. Even in a dark complected patient, uh, when you raise the legs and the, and the feet get pale white, that's a sign that the gravity is helping the blood flow. And when people have uh, gravity dependent circulation, they have PAD. When people develop these kinds of ulcers, and believe it or not, this patient didn't notice that, that they had these kinds of wounds on their feet and because they have diabetic neuropathy. So this is the kind of thing we see. So how do we evaluate these patients? We do things that are very similar to what the cardiologist does, and I get to wear both hats most days. Um, and so, for example, we do something called the ankle brachial index and then other tests. But really, the ABI is the EKG of the legs, the most simple and effective screening tool. And we do that by measuring blood pressures in both arms and both feet using a Doppler ultrasound. And then we take a ratio of the higher of the two ankle pressures over the higher of the two uh, arm pressures and we decide whether that is normal or not. Based, simply put, the pressures in the legs are usually equal or higher to those in the arms. And if the pressures in the legs are lower than in the arms, that's abnormal and usually a sign of peripheral artery disease. Um, and so ratios less than 0.99 are considered borderline, less than 0.9 are considered abnormal and diagnostic of PAD. Patients with ratios less than 0.4 are at risk for spontaneous gangrene. So this is our patient, the, the woman that I described to you. Um, and you can see these, you don't have to be a cardiologist to recognize that these pulsatile waveforms look different than these flat lines. A flat line in medicine is generally a bad thing. And so here, uh, you can see on her left leg, which was the symptomatic leg, the pulses measured down at the ankle are diminished and there's less pulsatility of this. And when she exercises by walking, those pulses get even worse. Uh, and that's reflected in the 
uh, pressure measurements down here. So she clearly has documented peripheral arterial disease uh, in every way. So the diagnostic workup is a history and physical, an ankle brachial index, and then if we need to get more information, we do additional testing. So we've made the diagnosis, and the good news is that if patients are treated properly, the average patient will stay pretty stable uh, over the ensuing five years. Only about 10% of patients will go on to needing surgery or amputation. The problem is about a third of those patients will develop some sort of morbid or mortal cardiovascular event, and 75% will go on to dying from a cardiovascular cause. So any patient with peripheral artery disease, in my opinion, probably deserves a visit to the cardiologist just to make sure that they're on the appropriate risk factor modification to prevent any of these downstream complications. And these are the, the guideline-dependent risk uh, factor modification treatments, and Nisha went through all these. It is not a coincidence that they are almost identical to the guidelines for the treatment and prevention of coronary artery disease, and both the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association have adapted the guidelines to really be coincident. And it turns out that if, if you are in the group in blue and you're taking guideline-directed medical therapy, your risk of having a major cardiac event or limb event is much lower than if you're not taking guideline-directed medical therapy. So following the guidelines, getting treated for all of the risk factors will save lives and limbs. And then eventually, when we need to treat patients, if their symptoms are so bad, we have to restore the blood flow. And those patients who have claudication, like the patient I described, they can get their treatment whenever. Uh, and we are judged by how long that the treatment will stay open, or something we call patency. This is like angina in the coronary uh, literature, where patients who have chest pains with exertion that goes away with rest, or what we call stable angina, or angina, depending upon which continent you're from, um, those patients can be treated medically for a long time before they need treatment. But those patients who develop heart attacks, or in our case is critical limb ischemia, they need to be treated right away. Because if we don't, they're going to lose their limbs. So how, uh, the patient with critical limb ischemia, I just want to make the point that once a patient is diagnosed with critical limb ischemia, one in five of them will be dead in six months from a cardiovascular cause. So that's a very, very serious diagnosis. And these are some of the most at-risk patients that I take care of. About a third of them will be alive with an amputation uh, and hopefully a minor amputation instead of a major amputation. And almost half will be alive without an amputation, and even more nowadays that we have better medical therapies. So my job is to Im improve their inline flow to their feet and treat not just the big vessels but the small vessels. Uh, and we try to avoid surgery whenever possible because of the risk of perioperative complications in these patients who also have heart disease. We also make sure that these patients uh, have excellent foot care, and I, I can't, uh, with a diabetes specialist in the room, I can't emphasize enough that these patients need expert foot care because many of the patients can't feel their feet and they need somebody to take care of their feet in addition to their primary care physicians who frankly just don't have the time or often the interest in taking off the shoes and socks. So I'm going to show you the angiogram of this patient who after a medical therapy and risk factor modification really begged us to do something because she wasn't able to work and she still needs to work to maintain her livelihood. So. For those that are uninitiated, this is the aorta, this is the right leg, the left leg. The arteries up until the hip joint look pretty good, but then as we inject dye from the hip down, you can see this is the artery called the superficial femoral. It's sort of the super highway from the hip to the knee, and you can see some lumps and bumps, and then as we get further down, you'll see that there's a total blockage. Blood flow stops here and then restarts here, and it's getting around this blockage through the body's own bypass channels that we call collateral circulation, which develops when patients are walking and have this kind of arterial disease. So a little better picture of this is shown here. You can see there's a total blockage from here to here. That's about five inches in her thigh. Uh, and then the, the artery resumes with some lumpy, bumpy disease, but fortunately not too bad uh, uh, of blockages down. And then you can see we have pictures all the way down to the foot where we can see that their blood actually reaches the foot pretty intact. So we have a lot of great treatments, but whereas this patient used to get bypass surgery, we now can, with uh, specially developed medicated balloons, do balloon angioplasty and restore flow in about a procedure that lasts about 30 minutes and that the patient can walk out of the building uh, in about four hours.
And so, uh, you know, she said immediately that she felt better walking. Uh, and this was done on Monday. So I'll be seeing her in follow up on uh, the following Tuesday. So we'll see how she's doing. But I she told me she was going to try not to work this week. But I, I don't have any bets on that. Um, she's a hard charger. And I bet you she's back at work already, despite doctor's orders. The last thing I wanted to leave you with is that certain geographies in this country have low rates of revascularization. So the treatment I just showed you was really pioneered by scientists at, at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation uh, and uh, at a academic institutions all over the country. And it's really easy and effective. The problem is it's not widely available. If you look at these areas that are lighter in color, they have very few revascularization procedures done. And you can see that there's geographic differences. Here in New York, we don't have any problems. We're pretty well covered. Um, but the inverse of that is amputation. So where there's less revascularization, there's more amputation. And amputation is an ep epidemic problem here in the United States, and the diabetic patient is the most at risk. So for those that have end organ problems, such as heart, uh, cerebrovascular, and uh, peripheral artery disease uh, with diabetes, they're at high risk for amputation. And depending upon where they live, they may or may not be able to get access to the kind of care that we just showed you uh, for our patient. So let me summarize that uh, PAD is a common manifestation of systemic atherosclerosis. Diabetic patients are at high risk for development of PAD and the subsequent complications, three to five times the standard risk, and that early diagnosis and medical therapy can delay or prevent clinically significant disease. Thanks very much.